Grace and Peace. This is New Testament video 366, Acts Lesson 42. Continuing with Acts 13, our second lesson. Heavenly Father, thank you for another day of grace. We ask for our spiritual knowledge, spiritual wisdom, and spiritual understanding as the Holy Spirit teaches us through these words that he has inspired and preserved through history and translated in our language, the King James Bible. Thank you, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Acts 13. Paul's first apostolic, not missionary, first apostolic journey. Let me read the first 12 verses of Acts 13. Acts 13, 1. Now there were in the church that was at Antioch certain prophets and teachers, as Barnabas and Simeon that was called Niger and Lucius of Cyrene, and Manaen, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me Barnabas and Saul for the work whereunto I have called them. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. And when they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they had also John to their minister. Verse 6, our present lesson. And when they had gone through the isle unto Paphos, they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar Jesus, which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. But Elimus the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him, and said, O fool of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. Then the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. How bizarre is this?
already in Acts 13, our prior study, we discussed the church, the body of Christ, as manifested here in Antioch, Syria. Antioch, Syria. Here is Jerusalem, Palestine, down at the bottom right corner. Antioch is up north, up north. Antioch, Syria, on the Orontes River. Antioch, Syria. Remember Acts 11, verse 26. The disciples were called Christians first in Antioch, Antioch, Syria. Saul of Tarsus has a ministry with Barnabas in Antioch, Syria, at the close of Acts 11. Acts 12, really quickly, Acts 12, the narrative briefly switches to Jerusalem. There's Herod Agrippa I, king in Israel, king in Jerusalem. A picture of the Antichrist, yet future from us. Jerusalem has dismal spiritual conditions. Apostate, unbelieving, blind, dark, darkened. Spiritual ignorance, blindness, unbelief, satanic influence. In the book of Acts, Israel would have already accepted the Antichrist. Daniel's 70th week would already be underway. The wrath of God would have already fallen on Israel, apostate Israel, having abandoned the truth of God's Word and God's Son, Jesus Christ. We don't want Him. And that was during His earthly ministry and in early Acts with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Israel refused to convert to the Lord Jesus Christ, whether in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are early acts. Could I read this quote to you? Listen well. Until we see this clearly, until we see that the gospel of the grace of God belongs to the great mystery revealed only after Israel had rejected her king both in incarnation and in resurrection, we must remain entangled in the hopeless confusion which has embroiled those who are still trying to serve God acceptably 
under the wrong commission. Let me repeat it. A Bible teacher of long ago penned the following words. Until we see this clearly, until we see that the gospel of the grace of God belongs to the great mystery revealed only after Israel had rejected her king, both in incarnation and in resurrection, we must remain entangled in the hopeless confusion which has embroiled those who are still trying to serve God acceptably under the wrong commission. What does that mean, Brother Sean? It means exactly what it says. You listen to the, quote, Christian. <laughs> we use the term loosely there. You listen to the average Christian sermon or read the best-selling Christian book. Listen to the celebrity preachers and teachers. Chris and dumb. Emphasis on the dumb part of the word. Dumb. Chris and dumb. You will hear. We need to follow Jesus. Follow Jesus. What they mean is name and claim the Sermon on the Mount. If you want victorious Christian living, obey the Ten Commandments. Take Matthew 5, 6, and 7, the Sermon on the Mount. If you want to do the work of the ministry, Matthew 28. Go, therefore, and baptize all nations. Teach them, baptize all nations in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Or, there's the Mark 16 commission. Some grab selections from Mark 16. Not all of it, of course, but their favorite phrases and verses. Or Luke 24, or John 20, or Acts 1. We're serving the Lord. We're worshiping the Lord. We're following the Great Commission. What I just described is I don't say that to be mean. I do say it in order to point out there's a problem. There's a problem. The absolute only way to solve any problem is to first identify it. Until we admit there's something wrong, we can't make it right. Instead of claiming Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, which is clearly, if we can read, if we are honest, Matthew to John, is Jesus' earthly ministry to Israel only. It is covenant ground. It is the law of Moses. 
Matthew to John is Judaism, 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 Judaism. We aren't Israel. We aren't under the law. We're under grace. Just, just by acknowledging those few simple facts that will help us overcome the hopeless confusion in our churches. Instead of Jesus' earthly ministry, there is something known as His heavenly, heavenly, heavenly ministry. After Israel refused to convert to the Lord Jesus Christ and Matthew to John and refused to convert to him in the early Acts period, then God raised up the Apostle Paul with a new gospel message, a new dispensation, a new program, the dispensation of the grace of God, the mystery program, the formation of the church, the body of Christ. I didn't plan on this. <laughs> Second Corinthians 5. Okay. Here is Christ's Commission to us. What is our grace, not great, what is our grace commission? It's not Matthew 28, Mark 16, Luke 24, John 20, or Acts 1. Those five passages are at the heart of Christendom's quote, Christian foundation. No wonder the professing church is so irrelevant and clueless. They are about as informed concerning what God is doing today as people with out of Bible at all. Oh, really? Really? What would God have me to do now? Wonderful question. The answer is swift and coming. 2 Corinthians 5. Let's try this one. 2 Corinthians 5, 14. For the love of Christ constraineth us, it motivates us, it compels, it drives us along. For the love of Christ, not for Christ, the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge, thinking, thinking, judgment, thinking. This is this is an intelligent understanding of some Bible verses. This isn't mindless works religion. We have to think. Take some verses and say, this is the way it is. 2 Corinthians 5.14 Because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves. See sin there? Living unto self. No. As believers, we aren't, we aren't called to live unto self. That's what we were doing unsaved. But unto him which died for them and rose again. See, see Calvary here? Christ's finished cross work. Wherefore, henceforth, know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, 
Yet now henceforth know we him no more. All? Oh? You know, if that verse was actually believed, not in the head alone, but in the heart, Ninety-nine point nine percent of quote Christian teaching would disappear today. <laughs> Second Corinthians five sixteen says we don't know Christ after the flesh. Now where would Christ after the flesh be on the Bible timeline? Matthew to John, his earthly ministry when he was in the flesh on the earth. We don't know Christ after the flesh. We don't know any person after the flesh. The fleshly identity, circumcision versus uncircumcision, that middle wall of partition is gone now, now. But it wasn't in Christ's earthly ministry. There was a difference between Jew and Gentile in Matthew to John. Read Ephesians 2. Second Corinthians 5, verse 16 again. Wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now, Paul's ministry, henceforth from hereafter know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation to wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself not imputing their trespasses unto them and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God did beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him, Christ. Read Matthew 28. Mark 16, Luke 24, John 20, Acts 1. All five commissions there actually branch off from the Matthew 10 commission. Those six passages, Matthew 10, Matthew 28, Mark 16, Luke 24, John 20, and Acts 1, whew, all of that, is Israel rising to kingdom glory. Israel converted first, saved first. And then Israel preaching to all the world in a literal, physical, visible, earthly, Davidic, Israeli kingdom. So, while in prophecy God has the world, the nations in mind, the order is Israel first, then the Gentiles, then the nations. See? Okay, now, if we are simple-minded, and most of us in Christendom are, we will look at Paul's Gentile apostleship and ministry and conclude, oh, that's the Gentiles of the prophetic program. And since we're Gentiles, we're the prophetic program. And there's no difference in those programs. See, Israel's program is Israel rise to kingdom glory, evangelize Gentiles. Gentiles in Paul's ministry is through the fall of Israel. Salvations come to the Gentiles. See, whether prophecy or mystery, it's all Gentiles can be saved. But it's depending on whether Israel rises, prophecy, or falls, mystery. Rises, Peter, falls, Paul. We don't live unto self. We live unto him who died 
for us and rose again, that's grace living. Romans through Philemon, grace living, not law, not law, grace. What God can do for us through Calvary. Because we are sinners unable to do anything for Him. Until we realize our commission comes from our Apostle Paul, from the Lord's ministry through our Apostle Paul. We'll go back to those prior commissions that he gave to Israel and we'll think we're doing God's will. We won't be doing His will. It's not enough to be scriptural. Let me be blunt, my friend. Countless billions are biblical, scriptural, and they're on their way to hell, quoting scripture. Mm -hmm. Countless souls are already in hell. Having quoted scripture, ooh, yes, it's true. Claiming, naming and claiming Bible verses that had nothing to do with God's present dealings with man. They used those verses and they thought that their soul could be saved by claiming Bible verses that had nothing to do with them. That's how Satan's evil world system operates. If we're childish in the scriptures, we are open to any and every false teaching imaginable. Just look at the denominations as proof. Thousands upon thousands of denominations, sects and cults. If we want to serve Almighty God today, we need to find out what is He doing now. By faith, do that, and we will do God's will. Romans through Philemon, the Lord's heavenly ministry. Oh, you worship Paul. That is what? We don't worship Paul. Romans 11, 13. For I speak unto you Gentiles, and as much as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify myself, no, my office, my office. The Lord gave Paul an office, apostleship. We can believe that or not. Paul's apostleship to us, we can believe that or not. I follow Jesus, Matthew to John. Good for you. You follow another Jesus, 2 Corinthians 11. That is not the Jesus of mystery, the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, Paul, Romans 16, 25. That is Jesus according to prophecy. If you are taking the Jesus of prophecy and trying to force him into mystery, it will not work. It won't. If you doubt, try it and see. Our grace commission is we don't live unto self. We live unto Him who died for us and rose again, Jesus Christ. To His glory. It's His life in us. Should be, should be. And He will express His life in and through us as we walk by faith in an intelligent understanding of His words to us. Romans through Philemon. If we don't have those words of God to us, 
then it's not the life of Christ in us. It's something else. It's the world, the flesh, the devil. It's a counterfeit. All right. We also have the ministry of reconciliation committed to us. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. God has made Christ sin for us. Christ who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ. God's righteousness applied to us because we are in Christ. Christ died for our sins. He was buried. He rose again the third day. 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and 4. That gospel message is the foundation for Christian living, the Christian life. If Christ died for those sins, He paid for those sins. And if we are in Christ, sin is not who we are anymore. Be. We're raised to walk in newness of life. Romans 6. Anyway, our commission is to tell all the world. See, we have that ministry of reconciliation. God has reconciled you unto himself by Jesus Christ's finished cross work. You need to believe that by faith. See? Faith. Faith in, in what I just quoted. Christ died for our sins. He was buried. He rose again the third day. That is how we have victory over sin. That's how we avoid hell. That's how we avoid the penalty of sin. That's how we or overcome the power of sin. Second Corinthians 5, verses 14 through 21. There's our grace commission. That was Paul's word to us. That is God's words through Paul to us. But if any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. Hmm? 1 Corinthians 14, 38. I want to stay with Matthew to John. All right. Go ahead. That would be willful ignorance. But free will. All right. Now. <laughs> Acts 13. Acts 13, 1. At the church in Antioch, Syria, this is the church, the body of Christ, there are certain prophets and teachers, spiritually gifted men, whose gifts take the place of the written, completed Word of God before it is written and completed. Here are the teachers and prophets. They include Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, and Manaean, which had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. There's the Apostle Paul. As they ministered to the Lord and fasted, the Holy Ghost said, Separate me, Barnabas and Saul, for the work whereunto I have called them. This is the plan of the Holy Ghost. This is not a man's idea. Hey, we need to send Barnabas and Saul on some missionary journeys. No, no. The Holy Ghost has decided separate for me Barnabas and Saul. I have some work for them. Barnabas and Saul. 
Saul, the Apostle Paul, Saul was made an Apostle way back in Acts 9. Jesus Christ himself ordained Paul as an Apostle from heaven's glory. Paul has been in ministry now 15 years. It's been that long since Calvary. Saul, he's known as Saul here, has been serving in the Antiochian church for some time, a few years, evidently. Now the Holy Ghost isolates Barnabas and Saul. Thus begin Paul's four apostolic journeys. They will cover a total of 15 years. So by the time of Acts ending, Paul has a 30-year-old ministry. The first apostolic journey of Paul is Acts 13 and Acts 14. Acts 13, 3. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. They agreed, they consented. Barnabas and Saul should be sent away. And so the Antiochian church approves. And Barnabas and Saul depart Antioch, Syria. Acts 13, 4. So they, being sent forth by the Holy Ghost, departed unto Seleucia, and from thence they sailed to Cyprus. And when they were at Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. And they had also John to their minister, John Mark. This begins, commences, Paul's provoking ministry. Romans 11, verse 14. Israel has been diminishing since her fall in Acts 7. Now the Lord will utilize Paul to announce Actually, three times in Acts. Acts 13, Acts 18, Acts 28. This is a 15-year period. Gentiles, Gentiles, Gentiles. See, the wrath of God should have fallen on apostate Israel. In Acts 12, like it did on Herod Agrippa I, why didn't it fall? Because of Paul's ministry. As long as mystery functions, prophecy cannot operate. The wrath should have fallen on Saul of Tarsus back in Acts Nine, it didn't. Rather, grace, mercy, and peace. There is a change in program. God has changed his attitude toward the world. And it's not wrath and war, it's grace and peace. Grace and peace. How can God do that? I told you already, 2 Corinthians 5. God was in Christ, 
reconciling the world unto himself. Because of Calvary, God can be long-suffering, tolerate, put up with them, the nations of the world, including Israel, which is now fallen. God has mercy on all because of Israel's fall. He's concluded them all in unbelief. See, think about it. Israel was not nationally converted in Matthew to John or early Acts. There was a believing remnant. As for the Gentiles, the nations, they're without God. Israel was to reach them in the kingdom, but Israel didn't want to accept the king, Jesus. So the Gentiles are left on the bottom in the dark. But that's where Israel wanted to be too, huh? <laughs> yes. All right. Well, what God did was, beginning with the Apostle Paul's ministry, is consider all lost Israel and all Gentiles, lost Gentiles, as lost. They must approach him now through Paul's ministry. There's a gradual change in program, the transition from prophecy to mystery spans 30 years. Acts 9 to Acts 28. It's a gradual unfolding. Peter's ministry didn't simply vanish, you noticed. After Paul was converted, you still read about Peter and his ministry. You still read about the little flock. As we move away from Acts 9, Further and further and further and further away. We read throughout the rest of Acts and even into Paul's epistles, Romans through Philemon. There was a change in program in Acts 9. It becomes more and more apparent as you move further away from Acts 9. There's a, a new phase of Paul's ministry in Acts 13. To the end, the Acts transitional period has Paul's provoking ministry. I might as well read it. We still haven't gotten to the verses that we need to. <laughs> Romans 11, 11. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation is coming to the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Now if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? For I speak to you Gentiles and as much as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify myself. No, I magnify mine office. If by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh and might save some of them. For if the casting away of them, Israel, be the reconciling of the world, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? Okay. The provoking ministry of Paul in Acts. Paul's Acts ministry is conducted in such a way as to appeal to lost Israel, lost Jews, which are technically, in God's eyes, Gentiles now. So Paul goes to 
the synagogues. In the book of Acts. And as he receives further revelation about what the Lord is doing in our dispensation, he tells lost Israel. He also informs the little flock, the believing remnant, the twelve apostles. And they are gradually brought up to date. Paul wants to save some of lost Israel like he used to be. So he visits the synagogues, these Jewish places of worship, where they have come to hear the word of God. Read the Hebrew Bible. All right, I will preach to you more of the word of God. What you won't find in the Hebrew Bible, how your God... Israel's God is now working through me amongst the Gentiles without Israel converted, without Israel's kingdom, apart from Israel's covenants. Anyway, the Apostle Paul is journeying far beyond the promised land, Palestine, the land of Canaan, to render Israel without excuse. Lost Israel out of the land. Will overwhelmingly refuse Jesus Christ. As they refused him in the land. The Apostle Paul thirdly. In those synagogues is declaring, announcing to dispersed, scattered Israel about the change in program, the mystery program, not the prophetic program. In spite of Israel's rebellion, unbelief, God is reaching the Gentiles through me. You want to have a relationship with the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, you come to Him through my ministry, Christ's heavenly ministry. My gospel, Paul's gospel, Christ died for our sins, He was buried, He rose again the third day. The gospel of grace, grace. And the dispensation of grace. All right. The map. The Apostle Paul, as well as the Apostle Barnabas and John Mark, at least those three, probably other saints, at minimum, Barnabas, Saul, Paul, and John Mark, leave Antioch, Syria, travel sail down the Arontis River southwesterly to the port of Seleucia. They reach the Mediterranean Sea. They travel to Cyprus, the island of Cyprus. They're on the eastern side, Salamis. They will travel across to Paphos on the western edge of the island, shore of the island. This is the first apostolic journey. They will move into southern modern Turkey and go like this. And they will return to Antioch, Syria. Roughly two or three years later, Acts 13, verse 6. And when they had gone through the isle, that's Cyprus, unto Paphos. 
So they've covered the island. It's roughly a hundred miles. They've traveled. 160 something kilometers. Aphrodite, Venus, Diana, a goddess is worshipped here in Paphos. So they've crossed Cyprus from east to west. They are now in Paphos, having departed Salamis. Paphos is their destination. Now look at this. Acts 13, 6. In Paphos, they found, Acts 13, 6, a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew, whose name was Bar-Jesus, which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man, who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. But Elimus, the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Then Saul, who also is called Paul, Filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him and said, O fool of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all unrighteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately... There fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. Then the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. Wow. Hmm. So they are on the island of Cyprus. Barnabas, Saul, John, Mark, and there's a Roman ruler here, Sergius Paulus. There is also a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew, whose name was Bargesus, also known as Elimus. A certain sorcerer, he's a false prophet, a sorcerer, well, let's state it like this, he's in harmony with the devil, <laughs> a sorcerer, like Simon the sorcerer in Acts 8. Or Jesus, Elimus, is a false prophet, a genuine prophet, speaks for God, God's spokesman, a false prophet, someone who speaks for someone else. <laughs> someone other than God, it'd be Satan. Ultimately, if it doesn't glorify God, it exalts Satan. So we have here a sorcerer, a false prophet, and a Jew named Bar-Jesus. Bar Jesus. You see the name Jesus there? Bar Jesus? That's 
important. These little details, don't dismiss them. These aren't here to fill up space. Bar Jesus. Barabbas. Take that name. Barabbas is Aramaic. Bar, the prefix bar, means son of. Barabbas, Abba father, Mark 14. Barabbas means son of the father. Or Simon bar Jonah. Matthew 16, Simon, the son of Jonah. John 21, Peter, Peter's father, was Jonah. Bar Jesus, take that name now, Bar Jesus. You don't need to be a genius. Bar Jesus is son of Jesus. Jesus. Jesus is also Joshua. Joshua. Jehoshua. Yahshua. Yahashua. Whether it's Hebrew or Greek, Hebrew is Yahashua, Yahshua, Joshua, Jehoshua. Jesus is Greek, the equivalent. It means Jehovah Savior. Jehovah Savior. Jehovah saves. Jesus means Savior. Matthew 1 21. He shall save his people from their sins, so call his name Jesus. All right. Bar Jesus. He's a certain sorcerer, Acts 13, 6. A false prophet, a Jew, and his name is Bar Jesus. That's all important. You will grasp the impact of those little details later. This requires some study. Study! Acts 13, 7. Which was with the deputy of the country, Sergius Paulus, a prudent man, who called for Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear the word of God. There's a deputy of the country. This is a Gentile, Sergius Paulus. He is what is called a Roman proconsul. He's a provincial governor. Sergius Paulus may be like a former senator. He is the chief political office holder here in Cyprus. Sergius Paulus has an advisor or an aide, Lord Jesus. Sergius Paulus is a prudent man, Acts 13, 7. He's a wise man, a learned man, intelligent man. Particularly because he appreciates Barnabas and Saul. Sergius Paulus, C. 
seeks to hear the word of God from Barnabas and Saul, Acts 13, 7. Sergius Paulus has learned the news of Barnabas and Saul on the island, Isle of Cyprus. And Sergius Paulus is curious. <laughs> hmm. An interesting way to phrase it. Sergius Paulus is curious. I'd like to hear the word of God. So he sins for Barnabas and Saul. Acts 13.8 But, contrast, on one hand, Sergius Paulus wishes to hear the word of God. However, on the other hand, the opposite, Acts 13.8 but Elimus, the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Elimus, the sorcerer, interferes. Now, see, his name has been translated, interpreted. Elimus. This is an Arabic name. This is his name in Arabic. Bar Jesus is Aramaic. Elimus is Arabic. Elimus means wise or knowing one, one who knows. Apparently, this is what the Greek speakers address him as, Elimus, the sorcerer. He withstood Barnabas and Saul, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Sergius Paulus has summoned Barnabas and Saul, but Elimus, or Borgesus, interferes obstructs, hinders. No. 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 You will not share the word of God with Sergius Paulus, Barnabas, and Saul. I won't let you. I will not allow it. Remember, for Jesus, Elimus, is a sorcerer. This is Satan's man. So what would you expect Satan's tool to do when God's instruments come on the scene? Stop. Hinder. Okay. Let me repeat this. I haven't said this in a while, but it bears repeating. Wherever God is working, wherever the saints do the work of the ministry, the world, the flesh, and the devil are lurking in the shadows, waiting for an opportunity to interfere, to hinder, to obstruct, distract, destroy, ruin, upset, If you are a Christian long enough and you're in the ministry long enough, you'll witness that firsthand. If you haven't, wait and see. Barnabas and Saul have been sharing the Word of God 
on the island of Cyprus. And now a politician, a ruler, the governor of the island, desires to learn God's word. Well, here is a diabolical religious leader, a sorcerer. He fellowships with evil spirits, devils. Hmm, this is competition. Barnabas and Saul, you aren't welcome here. The devil doesn't want you here. I prohibit you from sharing the gospel with this Gentile. Now, who's speaking? This is a Jew. A Jew. On the grounds of religion, and I must withstood them, opposed them. Acts 13, 8. But Elimus, the sorcerer, for so is his name by interpretation, withstood them, seeking to turn away the deputy from the faith. Discourage Sergius Paulus from embracing the faith, the sound Bible doctrine, Barnabas and Saul are proclaiming. Acts 13, 9. Then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him. Verse 9. Here is a new bit of information. We have not known this until now. Saul is also known as Paul. It's not to say that Saul actually had his name changed right here to Paul. Why I say that is Saul of Tarsus was both a Jewish person and a Roman person. He was Jewish and he was Roman. By blood he was a Jew, Hebrew. By citizenship he was a Roman. So look at some verses. As a Jew and a Roman he would have had two names. Sixteen. Look at Acts 16, verse 20. These men being Jews do exceedingly trouble our city. The Jews there, Paul and Silas. See, Paul is a Jew. See? Acts 16, 37. But Paul said unto them, They have beaten us openly, uncondemned, being Romans. 38. And they feared when they heard that they, Paul and Silas, were Romans. See, Roman citizens. Acts 21. Acts 21, 39. But Paul said, I am a man which am a Jew of Tarsus, a city in Cilicia, a citizen of no mean city. See, I'm a Jew. I'm a Jew. Acts 22, verse 3. I am verily a man which am a Jew, born in Tarsus, a city in Cilicia. Acts 22, verse 25. And as they bound him with thongs, Paul said unto the centurion that stood by, Is it lawful for you to scourge a man that is a Roman and uncondemned? 
26. When the centurion heard that, he went and told the chief captain, saying, Take heed what thou doest, for this man is a Roman. Paul is a Roman. Then the chief captain came and said unto him, Tell me, art thou a Roman? He said, Yea. And the chief captain answered, With a great sum obtained I this freedom. And Paul said, But I was free born. I was born a Roman citizen. Apparently Paul's father was a Roman citizen, which is why Paul was born a Roman citizen. Anyway, Acts 22:29. Then straightway they departed from him, which should have examined him. And the chief captain also was afraid. After he knew that he was a Roman, and because he had bound him. One more. Philippians 3. Philippians 3, verse 5. I was circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel of the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee. Paul, Saul, is both a Jew and a Gentile. He is a perfect representation of the body of Christ, huh? Jew and Gentiles reconciled in one body. Paul would have had the names Saul and Paul all his life. But the Bible, the Holy Spirit, never calls him Paul until now. Acts 13, verse 9. Why? This is a Gentile context. Prior to this, the Bible referred to him as Saul, 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 Saul. Saul. But see, the progressive revelation in this Gentile context. By the way, his name is also Paul. Saul. The name Saul. You remember a, a Bible character named Saul? King Saul. Saul, or Shaul, is Hebrew for asked of God. To ask. Paul. Paul is Latin. It means little. Paul does not magnify himself. Paul magnifies his office. Romans 11, 13. He is the least of the Apostles. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 9. He's less than the least of all saints. Ephesians 3, 8. Little Paul. Paul Little. It is also suggested that Paul may be derived from the Greek pau, P-A-U, as in pause or interval. And we know the Apostle Paul's ministry concerns the pause in prophecy. Acts 13, 9. Then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him, bore Jesus, Limus. Saul, Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost. Acts 2. Acts 2, 4. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. 
when someone is filled with the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God gives them utterance. The Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit, is controlling them, influencing them, governing them, guiding them, superintending them. Here in Acts 2, the Holy Ghost guided those preachers' words, the apostles' mouths. As the Spirit gave them utterance, they spoke. And these were intelligent human languages. This was not gibberish. Nonsense. Repetitious syllables. In Acts 7, Stephen, filled with the Holy Ghost, spoke to them, talked with them. Whether Acts 2, Acts 7, or Acts 13. These aren't men's opinions. These are not men's opinions. These are God's words. As we read Acts 13, verse 10. And verse 11, this is not mean-spirited name-calling, petty insults. These aren't Paul's opinions. This is the Holy Ghost assessing the situation. Acts 13, 9. Then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on Bargesus Limus and said, O fool of all subtlety and all mischief, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all unrighteousness, wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? And now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. Wow. Then the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. Do you remember, my friend, what I said earlier about another sorcerer in Acts? Acts 8, wasn't it? Who confronted Simon the sorcerer in Acts 8? Apostle Simon Peter. Peter. Here in Acts 13 is another sorcerer. Bar Jesus, Elimus, who addresses him, Apostle Paul. If we study the book of Acts, we will observe, take notice of several similarities between Peter and Paul. Acts 8, Acts 13. Peter and Paul confront sorcerers. Acts 3, Acts 14. Peter and Paul heal a lame man. Acts 5, 
Acts 16. Peter and Paul are free from prison miraculously. Also Acts 12 in Peter. Both Peter and Paul, Acts 8, Acts 19, lay hands to impart the Holy Ghost. Peter and Paul, Acts 9, Acts 20, both raise the dead. Peter and Paul, both water baptized. They were both water baptized. They both spoke with tongues. On and on and on. The Holy Spirit writing all of these verses and putting them into the record of the Bible is demonstrating, proving, showing how Peter is fading and Paul is taking his place. Peter and the eleven become less and less of an issue. And Paul comes to the forefront. And what Peter and the eleven did, Paul is doing. Stated another way, what the Lord did through Peter, the Lord is now accomplishing through Paul. This is another indication of the change, the switching of programs. Acts 13, 10. Saul Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him, bore Jesus Limus. You are full of all subtlety and all mischief. You're a child of the devil. You are an enemy of all righteousness. Wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? You've made this a habit. Poor Jesus, Elimus, you are full of subtlety, deceit, craftiness. You are cunning. You are full of subtlety, all subtlety and full of all mischief. You are an evil doer, thou child of the devil. Acts 13, 10. Whoa, child of the devil. Hmm. Because you are full of all subtlety and all mischief, and you are a child of the devil, and you are an enemy of all righteousness, and you don't cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord, what happens to you? Doom. And there's a pronouncement of judgment. Acts 13, 11. And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. Then the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. Hmm. Now, the key to understanding what has transpired here is to think about what has already happened in Scripture.
who are Jesus, Elimus. He is a certain sorcerer, he is a false prophet, he is a Jew. He's the son of Jesus, Bar Jesus, son of Jehovah Savior. He opposes Paul's ministry to the Gentiles. He is full of all subtlety, all mischief. He's a child of the devil. He's an enemy of all righteousness. He constantly perverts the right ways of the Lord. And now, the hand of the Lord is upon him. And he's blind, not seeing the sun for a season. There's immediately a mist, a darkness. And he looks for someone to lead him by the hand. And in light of all of that, a Gentile believes. This has been titled, The Story of Two Pauls and a Blind Jew. Two Pauls and a Blind Jew. There's the Apostle Paul and Sergius Paulus and a blind Jew or Jesus and Limus. Zechariah Eight. Zechariah 8, verse 20. Zechariah 8, verse 20. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, It shall yet come to pass that there shall come people and the inhabitants of many cities, and the inhabitants of one city shall go to another, saying, Let us go speedily to pray before the Lord, and to seek the Lord of hosts. I will go also. Yea, many people and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem, and to pray before the Lord. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, In those days it shall come to pass, that ten men shall take hold of all languages of the nations, even shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, We will go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. Israel was to be God's kingdom of priests. God's prophet nation. That is... Jehovah God, the Lord God, would teach Israel some information. Israel would believe it and then teach the Gentiles, the nations, what God taught them. That is how God would reach the Gentiles in prophecy. Yes, they were at the bottom given over to Satan, Genesis 11. But God was forming Israel to save Israel, educate Israel, and then Israel would drive out the darkness amongst the Gentiles by taking the word of God to the Gentiles. Israel wound up in the same darkness because they refused to hear the word of God to them. And that's where we find them. In Matthew to John and Acts. Content in sin. We don't want our King, Jesus. He's not Christ, He's not the Son of God. And that is what Israel predominantly said to Peter and Paul. 
as well as to Jesus himself in his earthly ministry. Israel was to be God's kingdom of priests. God's prophet nation. Speaking the word of God. John 1. John 1. John 1. Here's what happened. John 1. Verse 10. He, that's the word, Jesus Christ, was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. Which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. God planned this. The nation Israel. He wanted Israel to be his sons. These are the sons of God. Who do his work in the earth. But it wasn't national Israel becoming the sons of God here. It was a believing remnant. God wanted the whole nation to believe the gospel of the kingdom in Matthew to John. They didn't, didn't. The nation could have been the sons of God, but they chose not to be by refusing the capital S, Son of God. John 8. What's their problem? John 8. John chapter 8, verse 44. Jesus speaking to apostate Israel, the religious leaders. John 8, 44. Ye are of your father, the devil. The devil. And the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Hmm. So Christ talks to Israel here. God is my father. But God is not your father, which is why you refuse me. You know who your father is? The devil. The devil. And we are incompatible. God and Satan cannot fellowship. God is on my side. You are not on his side. Oh, ooh. Oh, and that outraged them. Because, see, Israel was so pious, religious, they were willing to dismiss the Gentiles as Satan worshipers. But for them to be accused of that, uh-uh. No, 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 no. The cross for you, Jesus. We won't have you talking about us like that. So listen. Israel, whether it's Matthew to John or Acts, Israel is not a group of sons of God, but a group of sons of Satan, the devil. Hmm. They should be bore Jesus, a son of Jesus, a son of Jehovah Savior, but they aren't, they aren't. They've chosen to be the children of the devil. Hmm. So, here is the Holy Spirit through Paul announcing. To a lost Jew, a false prophet, they don't speak the word of God, they speak the word of Satan. Error, not truth, error. Just like Bar-Jesus, Elimus. 
Acts 13, 9. Then Saul, who also is called Paul, filled with the Holy Ghost, set his eyes on him and said, O fool of all subtlety and all mischief, you are packed. You are up to the brim with subtlety and mischief. That's apostate Israel, thou child of the devil, thou enemy of all righteousness. All that is right in God's sight, you oppose it, you refuse it, you reject it. Wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? Whatever God is doing, He's doing what is right. And there you are, refusing to cooperate. And this is whether it's Christ or the ministry, or Peter or Paul. This is a habit. Wilt thou not cease to pervert the right ways of the Lord? This isn't an occasional opposition. This is, this is constant aggression toward the truth. You look at how Israel treated Jesus in Matthew to John, culminating with the crucifixion. You look at how they treated Peter and the eleven in early Acts. And now, for the rest of Acts, how they treat Paul. Hmm. They keep their family tradition. A for consistency. And now, here's another layer. A Gentile who wishes to hear from the Lord and a Jew prevents it. First Thessalonians 2. Look at the parallel. First Thessalonians 2. See, we look at verses, study verses. And it becomes obvious what is occurring here. 1 Thessalonians 2, verse 13. Paul writing to the saints, the body of Christ, in Thessalonica. Thessalonians, they're Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians 2, 13. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when ye Gentiles received the word of God, received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Gentiles receive the word of God, believe the word of God. Paul's ministry. 1 Thessalonians 2.14 For ye, brethren, became followers of the churches of God, which in Judea are in Christ Jesus. Now there's the little flock. Ye are like the churches of God in Judea. You suffer the same persecution. For ye also have suffered like things of your own countrymen, even as they have of the Jews, who both killed the Lord Jesus and their own prophets including Stephen, Acts 7, and have persecuted us, that's Paul and his ministry companions, and they please not God, and are contrary to all men, forbidding us to speak to the Gentiles that they might be saved, to fill up their sins all the way, all the way, for the wrath is come upon them to the uttermost. Ooh. In other words, whether it was before Paul or during Paul, Israel overwhelmingly rejected God's word. They didn't want the scriptures and they didn't want the Gentiles having the scriptures either. 
We don't want the truth. We don't want to share the truth with others. And we don't want those others having anyone else tell them the truth either. The wrath of God has come upon them, Israel, to the uttermost. The wrath in the sense of the fall of Israel. Acts 7. Even after God changed the program and poured out grace, mercy, and peace on apostate Israel like Saul, Was apostate Israel grateful? No. The very thing that kept Daniel's 70th week from falling on them, Paul's ministry, they opposed that too. As Paul conducts his ex ministry, you will see that as we continue in Acts. Unsaved Jews interfere and discourage and harass the Apostle Paul and his Gentile converts, preventing Paul's ministry from reaching the Gentiles as Bar Jesus Elimus did here with Sergius Paulus. See, this is Paul's first. Miracle recorded in the Bible. Acts 13. The blinding of a Jew. This dispensational miracle of Paul foreshadows Paul's ministry. What does Paul's ministry entail? One the blinding of Israel to the salvation of Gentiles in spite of Israel's rebellion. Instead of watching the news, <laughs> propaganda, take your Bible, read these chapters of Acts. Acts 14, Acts 17, Acts 18, Acts 19, Acts 20, Acts 21, Acts 22, Acts 23, Acts 25, Acts 26, Acts 28. And pick out those places where unsaved, lost Jews cause trouble for Paul and his Gentile converts. That's how Satan is working in Acts now. Saul of Tarsus is a saved man. Saul of Tarsus is of no use to Satan anymore. Used to be. Read Acts 7, Acts 8, Acts 9. Hmm. But Satan doesn't give up so easily. Well, God, if you take Saul of Tarsus and use him, and I can't use him anymore, I'll find some other fools to cause your people trouble. And he uses apostate Israel to oppose Paul's ministry of grace. Acts 13, 11. And now behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun for a season. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. Then the deputy, when he saw what was done, believed, being astonished at the doctrine of the Lord. The hand of the Lord. Acts 11, verse 21. The hand of the Lord. That's blessing. The hand of the Lord here, <laughs> that's a curse. That judgment, negative. Acts 13, 11. 
And now, behold, the hand of the Lord is upon thee, and thou shalt be blind, not seeing the sun forever. Huh? No. Not seeing the sun for a season. A season. This is a temporary blinding. This is only for a while, only for a time. Elimus bar Jesus is not blinded permanently, forever, perpetually, only for a season. And look at this, Acts 13, 11, and immediately, no time is wasted, there fell on him a mist and a darkness. So here he was, Elimus, the knowing one, the wise one. Now he's blind and he gropes with a mist and a darkness about him. What a transformation. He went from sight to blindness, like that. What a predicament. Acts 13, 11, And he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand. Hmm. As Paul is beginning his apostolic, not missionary, apostolic journeys, there's the blinding of a Jew. Elimus bar Jesus has temporarily been rendered sightless. Paul's first miracle in the Bible, recorded in Scripture. If you remember, in John 2, Jesus' first miracle recorded in the Bible, John 2, turning water into wine. What is Jesus' ministry all about? In short, restoring to Israel kingdom, joy, and gladness. I taught that long ago in John. Watch New Testament video 254. That was over a hundred lessons ago. New Testament video 254. John lesson 8. Jesus' first miracle. Transforming the water into wine. Now, more recently, Acts 3, Peter's first miracle. The lame man, Acts 3, that's New Testament video 335, Acts lesson 11. Watch that video for more information. Peter's ministry concerns restoring Israel to walk into God's literal, physical, visible, earthly kingdom and do His will. Here's Paul's ministry, Acts 13. And Paul's first miracle, the blinding of a Jew, temporarily blinding the Jew, and the salvation of Gentiles with the Jew blinded. Israel's rejection, refusal of God's word and salvation going to the Gentiles. Romans 11. Read it again. Romans 11, 11. 
Except now we'll go even further into Romans 11. Romans 11, 11. I say then, have they, Israel, stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but rather through their fall, salvation is coming to the Gentiles for to provoke them to jealousy. Now if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them the riches of the Gentiles, how much more their fullness? See? Through Israel's fall, salvation is come to the Gentiles. How? Romans 11, 13. For I speak to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I, Paul, am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify my office. If by any means I may provoke to emulation them which are my flesh and might save some of them. Verse 25. For I would not, brethren, Romans 11, 25, that ye should be... Huh? How do we avoid Bible ignorance? Read the Bible. So, in Romans 11 here, there's a truth. The Holy Spirit assumes there will be much ignorance about it. Very few, precious few, will know this. So listen, listen. I will move Paul to write some information in the Bible here so that you, the reader, will not be ignorant. Could I tell you something, my friend? Do you know Romans 11? is rarely understood today. Surprise! Bible ignorance, huh? The Holy Spirit knew what he was talking about, huh? Yeah, 2,000 years ago. He thought there would be Bible ignorance about it. And look, after he wrote it, to prevent the ignorance, people are still ignorant of what has already been written. It's as if it has never been written at all, huh? Not God's fault. Romans 11, 25. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery. I don't want you to be ignorant, unlearned, uninformed of this mystery, this secret. What secret, Paul? Okay. I lay it out for you. Romans 11, 25. Lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel forever. Romans 11, 25. That blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Zion the deliverer, and shall turn away in godliness from Jacob, for this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes, but as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes, for the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. Is God dealing with Israel today? No. Is Israel rising to kingdom glory today? No. Is Israel risen to kingdom glory today? No. God is forming the church, the body of Christ. There is no literal, physical, visible, earthly, Davidic, Israeli kingdom of God now, is there? No. Watch your local news. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. I told you don't do that. (laughs) 
if you're in doubt, watch your local news. That's not God's kingdom, huh? Uh-uh. <laughs> Satan's kingdom. Because there is no literal, physical, visible, earthly, Davidic, Israeli kingdom. A great many have assumed there never will be. And that it was all a lie. And Jesus must have been referring to a spiritual, invisible reign in the hearts of men. <laughs> ah, millennialism. The other false teaching is post-millennialism. We bring in the kingdom on the earth by preaching the gospel and making everyone a church member. No, that won't work either. Has it worked for 2,000 years? Since God is forming the church, the body of Christ today, it has been assumed in many church circles that we're Israel. See? That we've re replaced Israel and that all of Israel's blessings and promises have been transferred to us. Now, who gets the curses? Now, who gets the curses? Oh, well, not us, Israel. <laughs> How convenient. How convenient, huh? Romans 11.25 corrects that thinking. Romans 11.25 For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits. In order for you not to be wise in your own conceits, I write this. To be wise in your own conceits. Conceited means you believe you are someone you are not. You have your identity confused with someone else. A conceited person, for example, I'm sinless, my nose is high in the air, I don't sin, I keep the law. That's a conceited person. A sinner asserting his or her so-called sinlessness. That's conceit. Conceitedness. Not sinlessness, conceitedness. <laughs> Paul is writing, so we won't confuse ourselves with someone else. Who would be the someone else? It'd be Israel. Israel is blind today. Okay. Are we blind? Then we aren't Israel. Huh? See? See how simple that is. Romans 11, 25. Blindness in part is happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And so all Israel shall be saved. See? God is not through with Israel. God is not dealing with Israel today. True. But he will deal with them in the future. After Paul's ministry ends. The dispensation of grace closes. See? Rightly dividing the word of truth. Careful not to mix prophecy and mystery. Peter and Paul, Israel and the body of Christ. God is forming the church, the body of Christ today. That's temporary. Paul's ministry will not last forever. The dispensation of grace is only for a set time. Prophecy will resume only when mystery is done. The blinding of Israel, the blinding of Bar Jesus, Elimus, is for a season, not forever. God is not finished with Israel. We have not replaced Israel. Israel has a glorious future. It's because of God's goodness, not Israel's goodness. Okay. 
Israel is momentarily blinded. Thou shalt not see the sun for a season. Acts 13, 11. And immediately there fell on him a mist and a darkness, and he went about seeking some to lead him by the hand, like Saul of Tarsus back in Acts 9. He was looking for someone to lead him by the hand, too. The blinding of Israel. Temporary, temporarily blinding Israel. Temporary blinding of Israel. Not permanent. Not perpetual. For a while. Acts 13, 12. Then the deputy, here Sergius Paulus, a Gentile, when he saw what was done, he believed. He was astonished, shocked, surprised at the doctrine of the Lord. Here is a believing Gentile in the context of an unbelieving Jew. A Jew who did the devil's work in trying to prevent this Gentile from being saved. See, that's Israel refusing to let Paul's ministry continue. We will see Israel indicted, blamed, charged with wrongdoing in Acts 13, Acts 18, and Acts 28. This is typical of the dispensation of grace. A blinding of a Jew and the faith of a Gentile. The book of Acts is not our doctrine. It's the record of how God was just, fair, righteous in taking the prophetic program and pausing it, inserting the mystery program and setting Israel aside for a time so he can go to the Gentiles through Paul's ministry. Why God was fair in setting unbelieving Israel aside temporarily and how he went to Gentiles without Israel. That's the record of Acts. Our doctrine is Romans through Philemon. The book of Acts shows us how we got from prophecy to mystery. Peter to Paul, Israel to the body of Christ, law of grace. The blinding of Israel. Isaiah. In the scriptures, Israel is blinded thrice, three times. Isaiah 6. Here is an interesting study. Isaiah 6. Isaiah had a ministry 700 years before Christ. Seven hundred BC. to approximately 750, something along those lines. Now, roughly 700 years before Isaiah, 
800 years before Isaiah, Israel had Moses' ministry. Israel had the books of Moses. They've had prophets, preachers sent to them, writing to them, speaking to them, all the way up to Isaiah's time, centuries, and they've been in unbelief and sin. Isaiah 6, Isaiah 6, verse 9, Isaiah commissioned the prophet Isaiah, Isaiah 6, 9, and he said, Go and tell this people, God instructing Isaiah, Hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not, make the heart of this people fat, and make their ears heavy, and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and convert, and be healed. Since Israel has not believed God's revelation to them up to this point, Isaiah's time, Isaiah has a ministry that will cause Israel to be blinded. Judgment is falling on them. They will hear physically, but not understand spiritually. They will see physically, but not perceive spiritually. Isaiah 7, 14. However, there will come a point in time where Israel will have an opportunity to believe again. Isaiah 7, 14. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. When this sign is given, Israel has opportunity to believe. Now, Matthew 1. What is Isaiah 7.14 about? Uh, Jesus conceived. The Lord taking on a human body. So throughout Christ's earthly ministry, Israel had a chance to hear the word of God and believe. What happened? Matthew 13. Matthew 13. Jesus introduces parables. Matthew 13, 10. And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. For whosoever hath to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not from him shall be taken away, even that he hath. Whatever light they had, whatever information they had, if they didn't believe it, receive it. Now, they won't even have that. Matthew 13, 13. And these parables cement the blindness. Confusion. Matthew 13, 13. Christ's earthly ministry is halfway over. A year and a half they haven't believed. So now he switches to parables, so they cannot believe. Figurative language. Matthew 13, 13. Therefore speak I to them in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. 
and in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, Isaiah 6, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed. See, this is willful. This is intentional. This is deliberate. Not an accident. Lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and should be converted and I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes for they see and your ears for they hear. For verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see and have not seen them, and to hear those things which ye hear, and have not heard them. John 12. John 12. John 12, 37. But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him. It wasn't an evidence problem. It was a heart, 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 heart problem. The proof was there. It was abundant proof. Jesus is Christ. All the preaching, all the miracles to validate. National Israel replied to Jesus with this. Ha! Huh? We can't hear you. Speak up. And this. We don't see. Hmm. Don't want to see. Don't want to hear. Don't want to believe. They could have witnessed 50,000 miracles. But their heart was already set in not believing. Not an evidence problem. The evidence is there. Not a lack of evidence, faulty evidence. It's a sinful heart. We will never be convinced. We will never submit to God. That's sin. Willful. Willful. Deliberate, intentional. That attitude abounds today. John 12. 38, that the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spake Isaiah. Wrote this, Isaiah 53. Lord, who hath believed our report, and to whom hath the arm of the Lord been revealed? Therefore they could not believe. Because that Isaiah said again, Isaiah 6. He hath blinded their eyes and hardened their heart, that they should not see with their eyes, nor understand with their heart, and be converted, and I should heal them. These things said Isaiah when he saw his glory and spake of him. So in Christ's earthly ministry, there's another blinding of Israel. They had a chance to believe, didn't want to believe, so they're blinded again. There's a sign to cause them to believe. As with the conception of Christ, there's another sign to cause them to believe, if they want to. This one will come after Matthew 13 and John 12. Matthew 16. A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given unto it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. The sign of the prophet Jonas. Matthew 12. His resurrection. Christ's incarnation. There's light. To cause Israel to believe. Did they receive it? No. There's a blindness. As there was a blindness in Isaiah's day. Because Israel didn't believe what had come before Isaiah. After the resurrection of Christ. There's light again. The Acts period. Did Israel believe? Whether Peter or Paul? No. No. 
blind, blind again, at the end of Acts, the very end of Acts, Acts 28. Paul's provoking ministry is finished. We are 15 years or so after Acts 13. Acts 28. Verse 24. This is Israel. And some believed the things which were spoken, and some believed not. And when they agreed not among themselves, they departed after that Paul had spoken one word. Well, spake the Holy Ghost by Isaiah the prophet unto our fathers, saying, Go unto this people, Isaiah 6, and say, Hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand, and seeing ye shall see, and not perceive. For the heart of this people is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes have they closed lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and should be converted and I should heal them. Be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is already sent unto the Gentiles and that they will hear it. Hmm. That's that third and final announcement Paul makes to Israel. Acts 13 was 1, Acts 18 was 2, Acts 28, 3. Gentiles, Gentiles, Gentiles. Israel is blinded in light of Gentiles, Gentiles, Gentiles. Israel is blinded, Romans 11, Acts 13. But not forever. There's another sign to cause them to believe. And this is after our dispensation. Matthew 24. 30. And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. And then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other, regathering of Israel. And so all Israel shall be saved. Romans eleven twenty six. Israel wasn't saved in Isaiah's day or Christ's day, or Peter's day, or Paul's day. But at the second coming, Israel will be saved. The blindness is only for a moment. As long as Paul's ministry functions, the dispensation of grace operates. The body of Christ is on earth. Oh. <laughs> I told you this study would be more advanced than the prior one. That's sufficient. Thank you, Father God, for the light that you've given us here. May we walk in it, receive it, believe these words in our heart, rightly divided. Thank you. And may thou be glorified. Christ's name.